Good. Yeah, there you go. Excellent. Okay, so Shavuot, is, um, which is just in a few weeks, um, so we'll mention it now, is, but like all the biblical holidays, has two components. It has an historical component and it has an agricultural component tied to the land of Israel. So Shavuot is the holiday of, it's a harvest festival, of first fruits. It's like the, you know, this time of the spring, summer in the land of Israel, I guess there are like, fruits are becoming to, uh, getting to ripen at this time of year, and so it's that agricultural pilgrimage festival um, in that agricultural cycle with Passover and Sukkot. Um, and also it's a historical holiday, like all the other biblical holidays as well, and Shavuot commemorates standing at Mount Sinai and being given the Torah. Uh, interestingly, that piece of Shavuot is not explicit in the Torah. The Torah never tells us the date on which the Torah was given, but if you read carefully and you count it out, you know, lo and behold, the day that the Torah was given also happens to be coincide with the day of this major biblical festival called, called Shavuot. So that's sort of an interesting, like little, like uh, um, the vessel. That's an ancient connection between the days. And if you read, it's, I think it's more than an ancient connection. I think it's it's the plain sense uh, outcome of careful reading of the Torah, but it's not explicit in the Torah, as far as I am aware. It's not explicit in the Torah anywhere. Were, sure. Weren't we? So we were in the desert after. After we left, left Egypt, Egypt for yeah. 49 yeah. days, and I, then culminating on the date that we received the Torah. But the Torah doesn't, the Torah doesn't. So it was not, but also years, wasn't it? No, that, after, after we got the Torah, after we, we were going to calf, we stayed for another 40 years. That's what, okay, 40 yeah. years, that's the 40 That first year, we got the Torah, so, just, just, just seven weeks after leaving Egypt, we received the Torah. Uh, but, but the Torah doesn't give us a date for when it was given, what, what the date that we stood at Sinai is actually not exclusive from the Torah. You have to kind of like read carefully to derive that. And um, the Torah also doesn't give us a date of Shavuot. It just says, celebrate Shavuot after counting seven full weeks from Passover, uh, from the Omer sacrifice that was offered on the second day of Passover. So if you, again, yeah, so you sort of, you count carefully, you derive the date of Shavuot, and you compare that and say, oh, look at this, this you know, holiday is the day the Torah was given. So it's sort of like, a, um, like a secret that we discovered, rather than something that the Torah tells us directly. Um, so it's a very fun, so that's one of the themes of the holiday. So the themes of the holiday is uh, fruit and, and, and the, and the agricul agriculture of the land of Israel, and the theme of the holiday mm -hmm. is the Torah being given. Why do we eat dairy? There's, there are many, many explanations for why dairy foods are eaten. Uh, okay. One explanation is that when we receive the Torah, we didn't have any kosher meat yet, because we just got the Torah, so we all we had to eat dairy. Okay. Uh, Others say like there, 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 there are many. There are many explanations. I, I don't know if any of them are particularly. Uh, okay. There's some explanations. None, like, none of them is true. It's, it's a custom to have dairy foods and chocolate, so that's, that's okay. the same thing as well. So then, blintzes, lasagna. So then, well, so when you're having the dairy meal, is it on the, both days, or like some people have one dairy meal, one meat meal. Some people have a little bit of dairy each day. Some people okay. just like have some dairy and then before their meal, and then they have a regular meat meal. Okay. Depends on you know. In our family, our house, we love dairy foods, and so we're like really happy to have, we have dairy foods even on regular other holidays as well, that's, yeah. that's just us. Other people are much more, feel it, no, a holiday meal has to have meat, and so they, they're much more sparing with the dairy. Okay. Any questions on it? Can you, I, I, I still don't get it, so why only milk? Nobody really know. If we didn't know, so why? Oh, why, because yeah, I guess like it's hard to Why not only... Meat, yeah. you know, so, well, look, I guess you can't get, uh, it's not so easy to get kosher meat if you don't know. If you don't get, you know, they're going to have any kosher plates and stuff, you got to hard to get kosher meat, whereas you just have some, easier to get a hold of so some dairy So, this is the easy part. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This is there are other explanations, there are other explanations we don't really know. Uh, I think one original custom actually was just to have dairy first, and then to have meat afterwards, you're allowed to do. Right. Unless, it's like, unless it's hard cheese, yeah. you can have dairy first. And in so doing, we demonstrate just how careful we are about following the Torah. Mm -hmm. And so the custom was maybe, let's have some dairy, a dairy course, and then we'll clear the table and have a meat course, and this way we'll celebrate our holiday meal in this fancy way that shows how much we care about, uh, about observing the Torah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Any, any questions? Um, so, uh, is this just a Hasidic twist, or is it also accepted? It's pretty well, common. It's pretty uh, common. The following. Oh. The, I mean, the counting, the 49 days, yeah. is that just like that we have been in, in 49 ways of Tum'ah, and yeah. we're just really working ourselves up to a spiritual height, which is short oh, yeah. because it's a Matal Torah. Look, the Torah doesn't say that explicitly anywhere. That's a, no, late, no, a later interpretation. I think the Torah does connect Shavuot and Pesach. And, and, in several ways, and so several is tied to Pesach. So there are many ways to 
spiritual development leading up to Shavuot, or it's about uh, uh, freedom to responsibility, or a covenant of fate to covenant of destiny. There are all sorts of ways you can kind of work out that dichotomy and that, and that transition. But the two holidays are definitely linked in a very, in a very intimate way. Do you have any questions? Do you have a question or something? Or, uh, no, I guess I know like the rules of like not eating meat and dairy together. Yeah. Are we eating three or three or four hours? It depends on the time. Three, six. Yeah, so yeah, like you don't eat that. any meat. Like well, I guess you were saying because some people, people eat dairy and then have a normal meat meal. But, yes. Like, so is that can, allowed? Yes, because if you have meat, you have to wait to have dairy because the meat is like. Right. If you have dairy, you can have meat right after. Oh, okay. Because it doesn't stick. It doesn't stick yeah, unless it's unless it's hard cheese like 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 very like cheese that's been aged for more than six months. Which is very uncommon. Okay. So, uh, although actually now I get yeah, like decent cheese now, but, but it used to be very rare. But so aged cheese, it's more than six months old. You have to wait. But normal, you know, coffee with milk, cheese, whatever, you know, you can have that. Make sure your mouth is rinsed out, and then you can have um, meat right away afterwards. So sometimes we'll sometimes not in Shavuot necessarily. Sometimes our family, uh, if there's a, we, we've been known to have dessert first if we really want to have a dairy dessert, like a. Who was it? A friend of the. I don't remember when. Maybe it was like it was like a Thanksgiving meal. I really wanted to have like a dairy pumpkin pie, and so we just had dessert first, and then we had a, had some water, whatever, some vegetables, some salad, and then we had a turkey dinner afterwards. So that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Um, other questions about Shavuot? I have a question about Connie and Omer. Okay. So One in second. Hi. Uh, Mincha is going to be at seven fifty-five. So we'll see you soon. Thank you. So it says. Um, you shall count seven complete weeks from the day following the Pesach Rust day when you brought the Omer as a wave offering. Yes. To the day after the seventh seventh week, you shall count 50 days. Yes. So like on the 50th day, I guess like that's where I get confused because right, if we had to count 50 days, you would count at night, but it's 49 days. Why is it So the last days? day we count is 49 and we wait and Shavuot is after. The night after. after. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and then keep some background as to like where it says you, when you brought the Omer as a wave offering. So Omer is a unit of measurement. It's like a she sheave of wheat or something, or bar, you know. So it's like mm -hmm. so they would harvest it, I guess, right before Pesach. Then a this grain offering was brought on the temple on the second day of Passover, and that's when this count would begin. And so, okay. so, it's, so it's, the count begins when the sacrifice was brought. We don't have the sacrifice anymore. We still do the count. So that's what it's referring to. Okay. And then on Shavuot they brought this bread sacrifice. Um, all the sacrifices that, during the year like were made with bread? basically matzah unleavened grain things were like brought as part of the sacrificial rites and Shavuot was bread. So it sort of gets its theme of development and right we, the, right, the matzah becomes bread, right, on Shavuot because it, right from Pesach to Shavuot we, we bring this bread off in Shavuot. Okay. Alright, thank you. Okay, so it's coming soon, so you'll okay, so we'll celebrate Shavuot together. Uh, so one other just kind of before we just go into some we sum it at the time on uh, the next you know curricular item just uh, you know the the shul's been in the news a lot today yesterday for the, this uh, arson attempt and uh, just I think I said this last time I think there was something bad happened that happened last time that as well so, but I'll reiterate uh, one of the final stages when somebody uh, becomes Jewish is they stand before the beit in you know, in the mikvah usually and the beit reminds them this is actually it comes from the Talmud. Do you, are you aware that the Jewish people is a people that suppress them uh, at times and that uh, accepting uh, becoming part of the Jewish people and accepting Judaism as your faith and as your people means that you're exposed to anti-Semitism or could be exposed to anti-Semitism in, in potential and the Jewish Academy has to sort of have to be aware of what those risks are of being Jewish and living as a Jew and living as part of a Jewish community. And the Congress says, after the yes, I'm aware of it, and even so, I still want to cast my faith with the Jewish people. And so, I've, whenever I've uh, witnessed that or been, been around, you know, just knowing that it happens, I find it extremely moving, uh, extremely, you know, powerful moment in the uh, in the life of a convert. And um, it, it's it's important, right? And so, you know, people don't take on these commitments. Uh, there's religious commitments that a convert that a convert takes on herself and himself to uh, observe the mitzvot, to be accountable to the mitzvot. That if you fail in your mitzvah observance, you're accountable to God for that failure in a way that wasn't true before. And it's also there's a, a risk inherent in living as part of a Jewish community. And uh, I think the rewards and the benefits and the joy of, of living a Jewish life far outweigh whatever risks there are, certainly uh, in America and in, in our day and age. But uh, the risks are there and they're ever present. And there are moments like this that can be helpful reminding us that uh, whether we're born Jewish or not, that there are, you know, that there is a cost and that there's sort of something to keep, to keep in mind. Okay. Let's go on. Roman number four, letter G. This is actually pretty uh, simple. Fish and meat. There's a custom 
Uh, getting back to the Talmud, it's codified in the Codes of Jewish Law not to eat fish and meat together. Uh, nobody really knows why. Uh, the Talmud refers to it and says it's dangerous. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch, the, the very influential Code of Jewish Law, says it's dangerous. It doesn't say what the danger is. So one possibility is, oh, they had some sort of uh, concept of health and, uh, you know, they thought it was unhealthy to eat the combination of these two foods. And so, don't do it, it's, it's dangerous. And, that, and so maybe now that we think we don't know about that, maybe, maybe science has not replicated any uh, danger of eating meat and fish together, it's really okay. Um, nonetheless, most observant Jews have the custom of not eating fish and meat together. So the way that, but it's not like you have to, you don't need to wait, you don't need to have separate dishes or anything like that. You just don't eat them together. So how does what looks like at a, like a fancy meal with multiple courses, you might have a fish course. Uh, and then after the fish course, the plates are taken away and they're rinsed off, and then they're brought back to the table. Or the fish plates are small, and they're put aside and not used again, and then the fish forks are put aside and not used again, and then you have your meat course, your chicken meat course, with you know, different plate, different, different so forth. So, so it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a prohibition like dairy meat. You can, you can rinse off the fork, rinse off the plate, and you're fine. Um, but you wouldn't want to just have them all, but both in the same plate at the same time, using the same silverware without, without some separation. Uh, some people serve a little bit of uh, schnapps, like a little whiskey or something in between the fish course and the meat course as a way, again, to have that divide. It doesn't have to be whiskey, it could be a sip of water or a, a carrot, but uh, uh, if you're at a, you know, a Shabbos meal, a Sabbath meal, somebody might serve you some whiskey at that point between those courses. That's why, again, to differentiate between fish and meat. This comes and in, gets into trouble, uh, tricky when sometimes you have like a fancy Worcestershire sauce which could be made with like fish anchovies, could be like used to flavor the sauce itself, and you might want to put that on your meat, uh, and that could be a problem. So you want to find Worcestershire sauce that doesn't have fish. And sometimes it'll say, I'll say the OU, whatever H kosher agency is supervising the food, may say, we'll write OU, fish. So I warn you, don't put this on your meat. Okay, so it has fish in it then. If it says that, it means it has fish in it. That's then. why like, I just have a bit of memory of Lauren saying, an example she gave me was like, I made meatballs and I put, and I called her, I woke up and I was like, I put washed Hester sauce yeah, in my yeah, yeah. meatballs. And like, what do you do? And you're like, okay, this is how to handle it. So that's like, that's it. It's not a real, dish. like, that's not a serious, it's not a kosher concern like dairy and meat. Okay. But there's an ancient tradition that it's dangerous to eat them together, and the custom is therefore not to eat them together. And so again, you okay. serve your fish, of course, and then you take the plates away and rinse, um, or you have them at separate meals or whatever it is. Okay. So. You think it was preparation, like the issue of like how to cook them, and they just like you know when I finished my first, somebody somebody told me he thought it was like a it sort of it was it would invite the evil eye, meaning it would arouse the jealousy mm. of other people if you had two oh. kinds of protein at one meal. Mm -hmm. Think about ancient times where like the effort to produce enough food to sustain yourself occupied most of your thoughts and attention for most of the day. And a, system, and a culture like that, protein, very valuable. Um, really, really valuable. So I'm here, you know, eating with fish I meat on my table. At the same time, like, like anybody who sees that is going to be looking at me with a great deal of jealousy, and it was understood that that's sort of a dangerous situation to be in where other people are looking at you with that kind of jealousy. So I mean, that makes a certain amount of sense to me, and it seems... Um, yeah, and it's you know it seems uh, plausible enough. So. But there's no issues with dairy. Dairy and fish are fine. There's some of the custom not to eat dairy and fish. Okay. That's not a mainstream position. It's certainly not amongst the Ashkenazi community where we have lox and cream cheese and yeah, it's a delicacy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, do you mind closing the door? Sorry, this sounds a little you know maybe. No worries. So, so the fish and the meat is yeah. just traditions throughout. I mean, also yeah. the Yemenite and yeah. the Ethiopians. Yeah. Everybody yeah. Is. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ethiopians, are Ethiopians, they they separated from the rest of the Jewish community a very long time ago. So they have very very different traditions. But the, the Yemenites, they have uh, access. Oh, the Yemenites. You might have called I'm trying to remember if the Raman includes this. Yemenite, Jewish law of the Yemenites is very much influenced by the Maimonides Code. I'm trying to remember if he includes this or if he leaves this out. The Maimonides in his Code of Jewish Law leaves out every element of Jewish law that he believes is based on superstition. So there are, I have a list somewhere, and a, a scholar wrote, wrote a list of all the places in the Talmud that there are elements that Maimonides thought were superstitious, and he leaves them all out entirely in his Code. He gives, either he leaves out the laws entirely, or he gives different explanations for them. So I don't know if this, I, I can't remember, and the Yemenites, 
was very influenced by Maimonides in their practice, Jewish practice. Maimonides wrote a letter to Yemen, and he gave them lots of religious encouragement at a time of really severe persecution. And the Yemenites embraced him and followed his outlook and, and version of Jewish law with great loyalty. Um, so, um, but it's in the Shulchan Aruch, so it's a pretty, yeah. it's a pretty standard and you know, uh, basic. Uh, and you mentioned the fork and knives once you eat fish, so you have to rinse them before eating the meat. Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a, let's, let's do one more letter, okay? One more topic? Go ahead, anything else on this? Okay. H. Kashmir Mutensil. Ah, uh, that's a big one. All right, okay. Kashmir Mutensil. So the, another, another, um, we'll, we'll start this and then we'll. Letter H. Um, okay, so last time we mentioned that one of the uh, assumptions that the. Um, um, if the noise is distracting, it's actually okay to ask them to move the conversation to a different part of the building. So. Can you hear it? It got better once I can hear a little bit of a murmur, but, it's not, I, I, but I'm a trained professional, so I'm not bothered by it. But if it bothers you, you can, just, you can ask them, or I can ask them too. Okay. I don't care right now, but... Okay. Uh, H. So, um, non-kosher tastes are not only... So, okay, let me take one step back. Last time we met, we said that one of the major elements of the way that um, our form of Judaism practices kashu that you would, might not know just from reading the verses in the Bible is that I said tam ki kar, that the taste of the thing is like the thing itself. We're concerned not only with bits of pork, whatever, in our um, porridge, but also the taste. Okay, you remove the thing, but it leaves a taste because it's cooked with it or whatever. That's a problem as well. Tastes are not only um, imparted into food, again, some pork falls into your soup that's on the stove, but also taste can be um, absorbed into pots and pans and forks and knives and utensils and things like that. Um, and, that and then they can, once absorbed, they can be expelled then the next time you cook something. And so you cook something in your pot that had cooked clam chowder and then the pasta or the chicken soup has this taste of clam chowder and that's a problem. We talked about this in the last class. Um, tan kikar, bolea, the 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 the, blia, the the absorption, the swallowing up of tastes uh, in the things that they are cooked in. We also mentioned that none of us really observe this in most of our kitchens because our our kitchens we have modern stainless steel alloys and stainless steel alloys are so great because they don't do that. Okay, that's why they we have them in our kitchens. But if you use like a cast iron skillet, it will definitely absorb taste and it will give that taste into the next thing you cook. A wooden cutting board, chop an onion on a wooden cutting board. My wife is always yelling at me, you cut the apple on the cutting board that I use for onions, and now the apple tastes like onion, okay? So, uh, that, so that, that's, uh, okay, I'm not feeling that. But, like, oh, I'm sorry? A grill. Like a grill, grill, yeah, grill, grill, yeah, grill, because you leave the, re grill is also not just the absorption, it's also the residue on the yeah. grill itself, which can give a flavor for sure. But even if even a clean uh, cast iron pan might, might expel a little bit of, of taste that it had absorbed. So the principle for, for kashering, for purifying pots, pans, forks, etc., is uh, the method by which the, the taste was absorbed, and that way the taste is expelled. Most things absorb taste through cooking, boiling, right? You have something bubbling, you know, the lobster, the clam chowder bubbling in your pot, so it absorbs it through this boiling action, then it's going to expel that taste the next time you boil something. So how would you kasher? The way, how would you purify? You just bring it back up to a boil. The taste that's absorbed gets expelled, and then you're good to go. Except you're not good to go because the taste could be expelled into the water and then absorbed again. How does that help? Mm. Ah. So you wait 24 hours. The taste becomes rancid, as we talked about last time. You boil the pot. The taste then is expelled from the pot. Now in the way you have this rancid, 25-hour-old taste, and that taste can't make something non-kosher because we said rancid tastes don't um, affect, impact the kashi status. What is the rancid taste? A taste that's more that's been absorbed in the walls of the pot for more than 24 hours. So you wait 24 hours, you bring the pot to a boil, you make sure then it then it's, then it's good to go. You have to also make sure the outside is boiled. So you maybe as it's boiling, you stick a rock or something into it. It goes, you know, and then it. The boiling water goes around the outsides, um, and then instantly it's become kosher. It became kosher because it absorbed the taste through the clam chowder that boiled in that pot, and then it expels that taste into the next time you bring it to a boil. Um, 
So yeah. do you need, what if you waited longer than 24 hours, do you have to kosher it yes. through yeah. oil? Yes. <coughs> you things like forks and knives that aren't, uh, right, the knife absorbs, yeah. it has like, right? So I did it in boiling water, that's, I thought that's Same thing, yeah. Right. yeah, it, 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 absor it absorbed through, um, Hot? Yeah, through the heat or something, being cut put in something that was like piping hot, etc. cetera, so that's fine. Boiling water will work as well for a knife. Um, the rest of the You're not cooking with it, so it's like maybe yeah. somewhat different. If, if you're not cooking at all, um, if you're not cooking at all, then it's not really going to be a kashi problem, right? Because it's going to be, if, it, if it's not piping hot, <laughs> right, right. Because I mean, like, say there's like a really hot soup, and I put my spoon in. Yeah. Right. To like stir it. That's a kin to boil. It's a kin to boil. Yeah. Exactly. So right. That, that, okay. So then that would be. So boiling works. Exactly. For okay. that. Yeah. Okay. And with a spoon, you don't necessarily have to wait 24 hours because you. Um, let's say the other the other way you could do it is you put the spoon in a very large pot of boiling water. The taste that's absorbed uh, leaves the spoon. I want to give us time to uh, hold on. Hello, uh, hi. We're going to dive into the big show because we're going to finish the class, okay? Hey guys. Um, why don't you guys wait in the big show so that we can finish the class and you can have seats and everything? Oh, we're arriving with us, okay? Yes, please. Head over there as soon as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have a spoon, <laughs> you stuck the spoon into your clam chowder, it absorbs the taste of the clam chowder, you want to kosher it, you don't necessarily want to wait 24 hours, so you can put it in a large boiling pot, the taste of the clam chowder leaves the spoon, it's not yet 24 hours old, it's still a vital non rancid taste, but it's going to be nullified in 60 times its volume. If it's a big pot and a small pot, that's another way. So either when koshering you need 60 times the volume of water okay. um, to correspond to the taste that's been absorbed, or you need to wait 24 hours. Um, if it's a spoon, you might very well have uh, 60 times the volume. If it's a pot, uh, you're very much unlikely to have 60 times the volume of a of the pot itself in the pot, right? I mean, that's a, uh, we're gonna be in the big show tonight so that we can, okay, so. Um, in the big show, yeah. Um, it's very rare. I mean, I, I had a friend who did make like it's possible, but very unlikely to have a pot that contains sixty times the volume of the pot itself. You can do the math probably faster than I can. You can a very very thin wall, a very very large pot, right? But uh, very very unlikely. Can you apply yeah. the same logic to dairy and meat? And yes, exactly, 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 exactly. So if you have a um, you have a, a dairy. Uh, a dairy spoon that you stick into chicken soup. Now this spoon has absorbed meat and dairy taste, so it's not a kosher spoon anymore. You can put it into a boiling pot, uh, and uh, and that will um, um, and that will then the, the that taste gets expelled. Mm -hmm. If it's more than 24 hours, it's a wait 24 hours. Let's say the taste gets expelled, and it's not going to be reabsorbed, and everything is good to go. Or um, you boil it in a very large vat that's more than. 60 times the volume, and then it'll be nullified in 60 times its volume. So it has to be washed with a soap before? First, it has to be clean. This, yeah. yeah, this assumes that there's no actual food residue on the thing. So wash it off. It doesn't necessarily soap, just make it just clean. There's no actual food on it. This is only a method of removing absorbed taste. There's a rabbi in Israel today, Rav Malamed, uh, who has said that stainless steel doesn't absorb taste. And so you, we do all this anyway when it comes to stainless steel things, but you don't really have to, he says, because, or, or you have to, but, but if, um, you know, if you, if you were trying to figure out what happened and what went wrong and this and that, even that, there's another grounds for leniency is just to realize that actually stainless steel, it's a modern invention, it's less than 100 years old, and it just doesn't absorb taste. That's just the miracle of stainless steel, it doesn't absorb taste, and so none of this happens with stainless steel, which is sort of like a, a kashu miracle substance. Uh, so that's not widely practiced, people don't do that, but just in terms of your thinking like, I don't know, like what, what am I actually doing this for? So if it's stainless steel, the answer might be, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm doing this because this is the, the way in which we used to have to kosher utensils, and maybe it's not really necessary anymore, but we do it anyway. It's done, everyone does it, but 
um, just remember that the items in our kitchen are really not how our, even our grandparents had very different experiences in their kitchens. Uh, they didn't have, you know, maybe your grandparents had stainless steel. My grandparents didn't have stainless steel when they grew up. Uh, yeah? One last thing about this, sorry. So then you, the taste absorbed out of the utensil yeah. into the water. Like I used a stainless steel pot because I was like, okay, well, like, the yeah. pot's not going to absorb it, but do, is there ever an issue where the pot would then absorb the water that had the non So if it's, less than, if it's less than 24 hours old, uh -huh. and then it isn't 60 times the volume of the water, then you could be a big pot, yeah. So let's say I want to kosher and have a big... But I thought yeah. the water being 60 times the spoon is what makes the spoon right. away, but then the water's not 60 times, the, or the pot's not 60 times the water. It doesn't matter, because the water itself, in other words, the taste... Okay. You, 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 you assume... I see what you're saying. It dilutes it. Yeah, you take, let's say you take the spoon, you stick it into your clam chowder, okay? Now you imagine that the entire volume of that spoon is filled with clam chowder. So it's a clam, you know, whatever, two cc's, whatever, of clam chowder. Imagine the spoon is, is entirely hollow and filled to the brim with clam chowder, but that, which is like the worst it could be, but it's not going to be worse than that. So that spoon then goes into this big, big pot of water, so that water is going to entirely nullify and cancel out whatever infinitesimal amount of clam chowder okay. was in that spoon. Yeah. But it's and only then you just pour that out. And, and the water's fine. And you, yeah. just you can drink that water, it's fine. Okay. Right? It's fine. Well, pause here. Everyone's invited to come to Mincha Odam and Mincha in the big shul next door. We'll meet again uh, relatively soon. Um, when will we? You know what? I will. I'll have to look at my calendar. I'll put it on the calendar. I have a few things that have to fit into the schedule in the coming weeks. But pay attention to the emails from the shul okay. and look for the next time this class meets. Hopefully, we'll meet once or twice in June. I'm away most of July. So, once or twice in June, once or twice in August, and then the holidays come and it gets even harder. But uh, thank you for coming tonight, guys. Thank you. Thank you.